You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 112, The September Campaign, Part 4, Fall, Vice. This week, a big thank you goes out to Andrew, Miku, Ethan, and Roman for choosing to support the podcast by becoming members. Members get access to ad-free versions of all of the podcast episodes, plus special benefits that you can learn more about at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. Over the last few episodes, we have discussed Poland's preparations for a war during the 1930s, and today we focus in on the German plans for their invasion of Poland. I think one of the most important periods of any conflict is the weeks or months before it begins, as the group that will launch their attack determines not just how they're going to attack, but what the goals of that attack are. Today we will look at the evolution of the policies of the German government in the wake of the invasion of Czechoslovakia in March 1939, as decisions were made about what the future actions of the German military would be. The most important decision that had to be made was what an attack on Poland would try to achieve, with the full invasion seen in September 1939 not being the only option. There were also plans that would have seen a more limited set of attacks that sought to uh, carve off some of Poland before seeking to then negotiate out of the war, basically exactly what the Polish leaders feared might happen. Eventually, the plan that was put in place would be called Fall Vice, which would involve a full invasion of Poland with the goal of destroying Poland's military capabilities. We will discuss how forces were prepared and assembled for this plan before closing out of the episode with a discussion of a meeting between Hitler and his military leaders on August 22, 1939, known as the Obersalzberg speech. Then next episode, we will continue the, to look at the German preparations by looking at their military equipment, military hardware, and sort of organization of their military on the eve of the Polish invasion. While the Polish invasion would be the first real military campaign launched by the Wehrmacht, over the previous year there had been several instances during which there had been the possibility that it would be used in some kind of campaign against another nation. For example, during October 1938, this directive had been issued by Hitler to the military. Quote, Liquidation of the remainder of the Czech state. It must be possible to smash at any time the remainder of the Czech state should it pursue an anti-German policy. The organization, order of battle, and degree of preparedness of the units earmarked for that purpose are to be prearranged in peacetime for a surprise assault, so that Czechoslovakia herself will be deprived of all possibility of organized resistance. End quote. Then the eventual invasion of Czechoslovakia was called Case Green. It was a military operation, a military invasion. It just so happened that in this case, and in several other cases, while the Wehrmacht was preparing for a military campaign, it, you know, was not necessarily expecting meaningful resistance, and it would not actually have military resistance. But that didn't mean it didn't plan it like a military campaign. For example, in December 1938, when planning for the move into Czechoslovakia, the directive from the chief of staff would say, quote, The case is to be prepared on the assumption that no appreciable resistance is to be expected. Outwardly, it must be quite clear that it is only a peaceful action and not a warlike undertaking. The action must therefore be carried out within the peacetime Wehrmacht without reinforcements by mobilization. 
A similar event would occur when the German takeover of Mamel had been accomplished in March 1939. During that event, the German Navy had sent several of its pocket battleships, cruisers, destroyers, and torpedo boats to anchor off of Mamel during the negotiations, as a clear threat of force should the Lithuanians not cooperate with the negotiations that were taking place. But as I said, all of these actions would eventually be largely bloodless expansions, you know, bringing more territory into German control. But there had always been some risk that fighting would occur whenever German troops moved over the border. When these efforts were over and the goals of Hitler and the German leaders were achieved, focus then shifted to their next target, Danzig. German planning for military action against Poland did not begin with plans for a full invasion, but instead of the possibility of a military coup that could be put in place at a moment's notice by the Wehrmacht that would seize Danzig and hold it against the possible Polish response. Hitler would order these plans finalized in late November 1938. In a lot of ways, Danzig made sense as the next target for German expansion efforts, as it had been under a growing amount of German and Nazi party control since 1933. This control was led by Albert Forster, who would be elected the Gaul leader of Danzig, and began to do everything in his power to ensure Nazi control of the city. This included having firm control of the police and suppressing any other political groups that attempted to gain power in Danzig. Forster would even begin to put in place Nazi racial policies, targeting Jews specifically, which would prompt an official protest from the League of Nations Commissioner Sean Lester. Lester would eventually resign after his protests achieved nothing. Forrester and his actions in Danzig is one of those interesting cases where a local Nazi leader received a message that actually he needed to calm things down a bit in the months before Munich. Basically, he was agitating too much for Berlin, who was not seeking to make any serious move against Danzig at the time. Oops, you know, in the run-up to Munich, it was targeting Czechoslovakia. So he got the message to just maybe not make so many inflammatory speeches and to perform so many inflammatory actions. Speeches and actions that would be back in full force after the Munich Agreement had been signed. It would be at that time that political discussions between Poland and Germany would shift to focus on Danzig and its future. In several meetings between German leaders like Hitler, Ribbentrop, and other diplomats, and Polish leaders like Foreign Minister Beck, the Germans would bring up the idea of official negotiations around Danzig, with the goal of returning it to German control, and then constructing some kind of road or railway across the corridor. These discussions would always result in firm and unambiguous rejection from the Polish participants, but it was discussed in various conversations time and time again. The Germans just kept bringing it up. It almost seems like, to me at least, that it got to the point where the Polish Foreign Office was really tired of talking about it. You know, they were very clear on their expectations, but the Germans just wouldn't let it go. Regardless of what happened with Danzig, or if there were negotiations, or anything of that nature, the plan was always some kind of attack against Poland. But when planning for a war with Poland, German leaders by the summer of 1939 could not ignore the British guarantee or the French assurances that it would honor its alliance commitments to Poland. Because of this, any plans for a war with Poland had to include a discussion about what Germany would do to respond to Britain and France also entering the war. Hitler and the German military would plan under the assumption that London and Paris would declare war, although they would be more than happy to keep the conflict limited to just Poland if given the opportunity. In early May, Hitler would specify that the Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine would be ready to begin their economic warfare efforts on Britain and France as soon as any invasion of Poland began, although they would not initiate actions against either of the Western nations until they declared their intention to enter the war. On May 23rd, in a meeting with the leaders of the military arms, Hitler would say that while it was not certain that Britain and France would enter the conflict, Germany must be prepared and ready to attack the Western nations. This recognition of possible threat from the West made some parts of the upcoming plan for the invasion more important, primarily its speed and the actions of the Soviet Union. The eventual non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union was critical for a German war with Britain and France, due to the long shadow cast by the blockade put in place by the Royal Navy during the First World War. From 1914 to 1919, the British-led blockade of German ports had been very successful and had caused very serious problems, not just for the German war effort, but also for the entirety of the German people. The blockade may not have directly caused the famine that would be experienced in Germany during those years, to the point where civilians were starving to death in German cities, 
but it prevented imports from reaching Germany, which could have solved the food shortages. By securing access to the Soviet economy and the economies of Eastern Europe by conquering Poland, some of those problems would be solved, and the fears of a British blockade would be greatly lessened. While the military side of the German-Soviet agreements in, in the weeks before the war received most of the attention, the initial agreements would also include the Soviet-German Credit Agreement, where the two nations agreed to allow raw materials to be exported from the Soviet Union to Germany in exchange for industrial equipment that could be sourced in Germany and then sent to the Soviet Union. This kind of agreement would then expand in time between September 1939 and June 1941 as the two nations tried to utilize the resources of the other to solve their own problems, Germany and its lack of raw materials, and the Soviet Union and its economic and industrial shortcomings. It was not necessarily fully appreciated by every nation at the time, but the agreement with the Soviet Union and the early successes that Germany would see in 1939 would completely shift the economic warfare calculus. This is something that the British and French would be late in recognizing, and they would persist in the idea that the economic efforts that they were making and the economic warfare they were imposing on Germany was having a serious effect, and would continue to have an impact even though they really weren't. But this drastic change in expectations versus reality was not completely understood when the Soviet agreement was signed. Regardless of economic warfare efforts, Hitler saw the conflict with England and France to be the real war that Germany had to prepare itself for, as it would be a life-and-death struggle, as he would call it, with those other nations, and it would require a huge amount of effort and sacrifice from the German people and the German military, and most importantly it meant that Poland had to be dealt with quickly, as quickly as possible. When Cynthia came to TurboTax, she had just launched her new side gig, a true crime podcast. I'm a first-rate detective with a golden voice. As her TurboTax expert, I made her second income count by guaranteeing 100% accurate filing and her maximum refund. <clears throat> what did she do with that refund? Find out next week. Switch to Intuit TurboTax and make your moves count. See guarantee details at TurboTax.com guarantees. Experts only available with TurboTax Live. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. To plan for all of this effort and sacrifice, in June 1939, the Reich Defense Council, led by Goering, would outline plans for the complete mobilization of the German economy. This involved not just the plans to mobilize German manpower into the military, with the number to be mobilized around 7 million, but also to try and determine how all of those men could be replaced within the German economy. Part of the worker shortcomings could be made up by simply shifting people around and how they were used in the workforce, but plans were also drawn up to begin to use inmates in prison or concentration camps as forced laborers. While these plans were still being finalized, there would also begin to be some shifting of German military units to prepare them for a future invasion of Poland. This included a slow buildup during the June and July timeframes that would see some of the units deploy to areas near the Polish border, although these efforts were kept secret as much as possible. The biggest problem was how to move troops and supplies into East Prussia. In any military plan for the invasion of Poland, the fact that the Germans controlled East Prussia was an important advantage, as it would allow the German troops to attack into Poland from the north, presenting the Polish military with another threat to plan against. 
However, in the summer of 1939, the necessary equipment and vehicles for an attack by the German military that were not already positioned in East Prussia had to be transported there, and the only way to do that was from the sea. Infantry units were a bit easier to kind of work with, since there were already two reserve infantry divisions that could be mobilized in East Prussia, and, and they would be during August 1939, and it was just easier to move men covertly. But everything else had to be imported by sea, and, and some of the things were quite big. It's kind of difficult to conceal shipping 160 tanks to East Prussia, and therefore the claim would be made that they were only being moved into the area to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the victory of the German army over the Russian army at the Battle of Tannenberg in 1914. Having the units and equipment pre-positioned in East Prussia for the attack was important because one of the primary concerns that drove German planning for the operation was that it had to happen quickly. Due to the threat of reactions from Britain and France, it was crucial that the Polish military be destroyed as quickly as possible so that if German units were needed elsewhere, they would be available, without leaving the Polish campaign only partially completed. The plan that would be created for the German attack, Fall Weiss or Case White, would be a relatively simple military affair. There would be two primary German military formations, Army Group North and Army Group South. Army Group North would be led by General Freder von Bock, and it would be made up of the 3rd Army, based in East Prussia, and the 4th Army in Pomerania in northern Germany. Army Group South would be commanded by General Gerd von Rundstedt, and it would contain the 8th Army, based in Cilicia, the 10th Army in Bohemia, and the 14th Army, which would attack out of Slovakia. These two army groups had two key tasks. The first was to attack into Poland and move towards Warsaw as two large pincers. The second was that on their way to the Polish capital, they would destroy as much of the Polish military as they possibly could. Due to its basic structure, a large pincer attack, the addition of Slovakia as an area that the German army could launch itself from was very advantageous, because it allowed Army Group South to extend the easternmost arm of its pincer even further east, increasing the possibility of cutting off Polish military units in western Poland. Along with the pincer movement of the German army, the Luftwaffe would commit two of its air fleets to assist in the invasion, with the goals of the Luftwaffe being to destroy the Polish air force, launch operations in support of the ground attack, and to perform strategic bombing raids on targets like Warsaw to reduce the general ability of the Polish society to continue its resistance. Specific plans for where the fighting would occur were limited by the fact that the Germans did not have a great understanding of how the Poles planned to defend their borders. This lack of understanding was rooted in the fact that the German intelligence about Polish plans was, was anemic, a shortcoming caused primarily by the fact that they didn't think it would matter that much. The German military believed that they could easily defeat the Polish army. It didn't really matter what the Poles were planning to do because the Germans were just going to beat them, so why spend time trying to figure it out? In the border regions, there were also efforts by the German government to influence the actions of ethnic Germans in Polish territory, and there would be secret formations organized in a few places that would call themselves self-defense units, although their goal was to assist the German army once it crossed the border. There were only a small number of these units, but it served the purpose of sowing distrust among Poles in some areas who were less likely to trust Germans because they knew that these units were there. Danzig would also receive some very special attention during the months before the invasion, with the SS providing specific assistance to Forster in the creation of local militia units that were primarily made up of men of the Danzig police. Soldiers were also dispatched to Danzig from Germany, with the SS sending a full reinforced battalion of troops that would enter the city dressed as civilians, while the German army would send officers to lead the militia units within Danzig itself in the hopes that this would make them better combat units. For the purpose of leading these units, Major General George Friedrich Eberhardt would be sent to Danzig with several junior officers and NCOs, which would begin training operations after they arrived. Throughout the summer, additional German troops would arrive in a variety of ways, sometimes by night and sometimes more openly in civilian clothes. There would even be an effort to bring in far more conspicuous military hardware, with some light artillery and armored cars being smuggled into the city. The goal of these efforts was to launch a quick and decisive coup within the city, if nothing else, for a quick propaganda victory. These actions were for the most part known to the Polish authorities in the city, but there were limits on what they could do in response due to the absolute, and I mean absolute, necessity that Polish actions not cause the first violence within Danzig. On August 28, 1939, a report would be sent from Danzig to Foreign Minister Beck that would state, quote, 
So far as manpower is concerned, I estimate the military forces in the Danzig area to be about 18,000 men, including detachments of SS, SA, and Hitler Youth, who are entrusted with special functions throughout the entire organization. End quote. One of the major topics of conversation after 1945 and at the Nuremberg trials would be around if the violence that would be the hallmark of the German occupation of Poland, and not just the Holocaust, but all the other violence perpetrated against Polish individuals, was premeditated before the invasion took place. Basically, was the German government and, and the German military pursuing a policy of genocide in September 1939? The answer to this is, is complicated, and we certainly won't arrive at a final answer here, but what we do know is that there would be plans for the German occupation to immediately begin a series of policies which were designed to sort of take the head off of Polish society at large, and to remove large numbers of Polish leaders, either by killing them or sending them to concentration camps. List of these individuals, over 60,000 of them, would be created in the months before the war in preparation for the invasion, and on that list were the types of people you might expect, political, religious, and cultural leaders. Special attention was paid to Polish individuals in what was considered to be the more German areas, like Poznan and the Pomors, or as Reinhard Heydrich would later describe it, quote, solving of the Polish question, as has been repeatedly indicated, is to be varied. One way in relation to the leadership, another in relation to the workers and the lower layers of the Polish population. There is still no more than 3% of political leaders in the occupied areas, and these 3% must be neutralized and sent to concentration camps. Einsatzgruppen, which should draw up a list on which they should place outstanding leaders, and also list containing the average layer of the Polish society, teachers, clergy, nobility, legionnaires, returning officers, and so forth. They must be arrested and deported to the remaining district." End quote. To accomplish these tasks, each of the armies that would be involved in the invasion, all five of them, would be accompanied by an Einsatzgruppe, which would be made up of Gestapo and men from Heydrich's SD. Beyond the general roundup of individuals, which would happen in many German invasions during the following years, these units also had a special task in Poland, to make sure that as many Polish Jews as possible were forced into the Soviet zone of control after the invasion was over. The exact border between the two armies was not exactly determined before the fighting happened, due to the ambiguous nature of whether or not Poland as an independent entity would be allowed to survive. And so the hope was that large numbers of Polish Jews could just be forced into resettling to the eastern part of the country and on the other side of the eventual border. This now brings us to August 22nd, 1939, and to the meeting held by Hitler, and which was attended by Germany's military leaders. When I started writing this episode, my plan was to quote from this speech at length, uh, but then, as I went hunting for more information about its contents, uh, things got a bit fuzzy. As with many meetings of this type, where Hitler was speaking about future plans to a small group of leaders, there's not a, a written speech or a published version and our records today come primarily from three types of sources. Notes about the speech written at the time, accounts of the speech submitted at the Nuremberg trials, and notes taken by participants in personal correspondence at that time. Usually I would just pull a few quotes that seem to be consistent between sources and, and go from there, but I think a deeper investigation might be good here, because this type of multiple sources with many only coming after the war is going to be something that we bump into many times during this podcast, especially on the German side. First up, we have what is a summary, but not the full text of the speech, which was found after the war when working through the archives of the German army. This was an unsigned memorandum, so we don't necessarily know who wrote it. Speaking generally, the contents of this memorandum are agreed to by all sources. You know, they do match up with all the other accounts, at least in the basic structure and content of what was said. But we have to contend with the comments made at Nuremberg and the documents submitted as part of those hearings. During those discussions, and I've actually linked the 170th day of the trial of German major war criminals in the episode notes if, if you want to check it out, Admiral Reeder has some thoughts on the specific wording of some of the accounts of the speech provided to the tribunal. Finally, we have first-hand accounts of the meeting that come to us in, a, in the form of personal notes, for example those of Colonel General Holder, which I've linked in the show notes as well. These obviously differ in wording from the speech given, as they were notes taken by Halder, 
but they just provide another way of looking at what was said. Typically, everything I just said would be a footnote, but I thought it would be interesting to surface that information here on the podcast so you can kind of know like what goes into researching these things and, and most importantly, the sources that back up some of these meetings that are so critical to kind of uh, paving the path of Germany towards the war. So what was this speech actually? I haven't I barely talked about what was happening. Well, it was Hitler basically reiterating to his military leaders what they were about to do, why they were about to invade Poland, and then at a high level what the basic structure of the campaign would be and how it would be executed. To quote from that unsigned memorandum, quote, I have called you together to give you a picture of the political situation in order that you may have some insight into the individual factors on which I have based my decision to act and in order to strengthen your confidence, end quote. Hitler also addresses England and France at length, saying that neither of their war preparations are advanced enough to be a hindrance to German efforts in Poland before discussing plans for Poland itself. According to one memorandum, quote, Close your hearts to pity, act brutally. Eighty million people must attain what is their right. Their existence must be made secure. The strong man is right, the greatest harshness, end quote. Or as Holder would record in his notes, Quote, the victor is never called upon to vindicate his actions. We are not concerned with having justice on our side, but solely of victory. Execution, harsh and remorseless. Be steeled against all signs of compassion. End quote. These were the basic tenets of the upcoming German invasion. Next episode, we will discuss the preparations that had been made by the German military in the years before the war to prepare for a conflict, both in their equipment and their training. <laughs> 